Um, in terms of my disclosures, um, I did a talk on shoulder replacements that I received a honorarium for. That's not relevant to today's talk for this subject. So, you know, in terms of femoral tabular impingement, what exactly is it? So it's a structural, it involves structural changes as well as dynamic factors. So it's an intra-articular and in, or internal form of impingement where you have repetitive abnormal forces of the acetabulum and femoral neck junction, which leads to mechanical stress and then shear forces on the labrum and cartilage. And this can lead to ultimately labral tears, chondral injuries, abnormal bony remodeling, which is how you get the cam and pincer lesions. And then, um, you know, at end stage, it can lead to subsequent arthritis. So FAI's common in patients ages 15 to 45, typically presents with chronic groin pain. So um, patients will say they don't really remember a certain mechanism, but that it's been hurting for some months or even years. Um, and then in terms of prevalence in athletes, so there's been a couple different studies done on prevalence. And in football, um, they looked at the NFL combine athletes in 2009 to 2010, and 90% of them had at least one sign of radiographic FAI on their x-rays. There's a study that looked at hockey players that found 75% of elite youth hockey players had cam lesions on MRI. And then looking at soccer players, about 72% of male and 50% of female elite soccer players had at least radiographic FAI. And then another study, you know, found that high level male athletes were about two to eight times more likely to develop cam lesions than controls. So, you know, a lot of this has to do with kind of abnormal joint, you know, forces as well as range of motions and kind of that repetitive stress and trauma um, that causes these changes to develop. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but obviously not all of these athletes are symptomatic, right? Because 90% of football players are not getting hip scopes or not requiring surgery. But I think it's important to know that these changes are out there. Um, and then looking more at the specific structure. So the hip labrum, as you can see in this arthroscopic photo, it's kind of this protective ring of fiber cartilage and it kind of lines the hip socket and it has a couple different functions. It contributes to hip stability and the suction seal of the hip. Um, but labral tears are actually really common, kind of like the radiographic signs of FAI. So they're present in over 90% of patients that have bony changes and can cause mechanical as well as um, symptoms of pain. The labral tears are also highly prevalent in asymptomatic patients. So the study by Philippon in 2012 looked at 45 asymptomatic patients. You should note here that the mean age is a little bit older, but age 37. Um, labral tears were present in 70% of patients. And so, you know, one of my mentors in fellowship used to say, um, not every labral tear needs surgery. And I actually quote that to patients because I think patients will get kind of hung up on labral tears, just like they kind of get hung up on meniscus tears or labral tears in the shoulder. And I think the, you know, connotation is something is torn, therefore it needs to be fixed. And so I quote this study to say that, you know, even asymptomatic patients may have labral tears. And so I really want to correlate their clinical picture with their imaging findings. And then, you know, really important is that patients over age 35 with isolated labral, you know, signal or labral tears on MRI, that really can be a normal finding or degeneration. So, you know, if they don't have any radiographic parameters that indicate FAI bony changes, I would really caution you to, you know, diagnose these patients with like a true labral tear. You can see here on the coronal MRI, um, here at the top is the acetabulum. And as you follow it down, this black triangle here is what we refer to as a labrum. This white area of hyperintensity is consistent with a labral tear. So I tell patients to look for like a little white line or white dot within the labrum. And that's um, how I um, describe the tear to them. So as you know, there's different types of FAI. So there can be the pincer version, which is acetabular over coverage or too deep of a socket. There can be the cam type, which is aspherical or bony prominence on the femoral head. And then of course there can be combined type, which is you have both. Um, here are some kind of nice animations showing the different types of FAI. So cam type is where you have the bony overgrowth, usually the anterior superior femoral head neck junction. And you see here as a patient flexes their hip up into the extremes of flexion, they're bumping up against the labrum and they can cause labral tears here. And because the labrum is then connected to the cartilage, um, that injury can kind of propagate into the cartilage and that's how they get chondral injury as well. So 
So I talk to patients about this CAM type lesion as kind of being a chronic remodeling where your body kind of lays down extra bone here. Um, and you often see the CAM type lesions in younger male athletes is the kind of typical pattern. And then in contrast, you know, this animation looks at pincer FAI. So this is where there's over coverage or too deep of an acetabulum. So with repetitive hip flexion, you can imagine there's just less space. And so, you know, your labrum is getting pinched a bit earlier and actually kind of crushed in this picture. And again, similar things can happen where you have labral tears that can propagate into the chondral labral junction and cause chondral injury here. The typical patient that has pincer type FAI is usually like your 40s year old female. Um, but again, patients can have both. Um, and this is kind of showing like almost like a little contra coup injury in the back. So why do we care about FAI? What's the point? So, you know, these studies have shown that if untreated, FAI can progress to labral and chondral injury and can lead to increased rates of hip arthritis. Um, Clohissy did a study looking at patients that were young who had bad hip arthritis already, and about half of them had hip arthritis due to FAI, half had hip dysplasia, and then about 10% were due to trauma, so things like femoral neck fractures and things like that as a younger patient. So, you know, what we don't really know is, does hip arthroscopy really prevent hip arthritis? Um, I think that's kind of to be determined with further studies. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to show that one of these days. So I just tell patients, we know that FAI is associated with an increased risk of developing OA in the future, but we're not sure yet if our intervention prevents it. So I don't recommend kind of prophylactic surgery if I see patients with FAI, but they're asymptomatic. I had a quick question just on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, is it that um, the remodeling that you see in like the cam or the pincer lesions is a... Um, is like due to the FAI or is the FAI caused by, it? it's like a chicken the egg question, I guess is my question. Right. Like what, what is starting what and what is resulting in what? Right, I think it's maybe a little bit different if it's CAM versus pincer. So for CAM, I think that's kind of abnormal bony remodeling over time as athletes do sporting activities. I think pincer is more of a, that's just how you were born. You were born with a deeper socket kind of like okay. the opposite of pincer would be hip dysplasia, which we'll go over in a second, but that's born, being born with really shallow sockets. So I think it kind of depends. Um, there are some natural history studies that have looked at like your alpha angle or your the size of your cam deformity in like 11 year olds versus 15 year olds and follow them through sports. And it actually increases over time, which is really interesting. So I think it's kind of a bony remodeling issue, at least on the femoral side. Got it, thanks so much. Yeah, great question. Um, and then looking at the typical exam, so in terms of history, patients will classically talk about groin pain. So I'm always looking for patients that are pointing kind of at their groin, or they might show you the C sign where they take their hand, they put it, and they say it feels like this, the pain's in this distribution. Usually the pain is worse with sitting, worse with sports and activity. They can describe hip kind of popping or clicking as well. And then in terms of exam, usually they have limited internal rotation of their hip. And this can be kind of subtle, even like a five degree difference side to side is important to note. Positive fader or flexion, internal rotation, adduction, and a positive scour test. And a scour test is basically you take them from the fader position and then you just keep rotating them in as you extend their hip. It's kind of like a McMurray's for the hip labrum. And you're just looking for pain there. I also look at pain with a straight leg raise as well as a positive stinch field, which is essentially you have them do a straight leg raise and then you, and then you give them resistance and have them keep their leg in the raised position. If they have pain with a resisted portion, that's a positive stinch field. Um, here's a quick video on how you perform a scour. So this is kind of the checking the fader. So internal rotation, adduction, flexion. And I take them and just internally rotate them and extend the hip. That's a scour. And sometimes you can go kind of back and forth to try to, and you're just trying to catch that labrum against the femoral head and acetabulum. So this is a positive scour if it reproduces their groin pain. So looking at imaging, the standard imaging set we get are oops, uh, AP pelvis, a done lateral of the hip, and then a false profile. So AP pelvis, obviously, um, we'll go over some of these images later, but it's pretty standard. And then in terms of laterals, you can either get a done lateral or a frog lateral. Um, and then 
you know, looking at MRI images, that's kind of the next line in terms of imaging. Um, you can either get a non-contrast MRI versus an MRA. So on this um, image here to the right, this is an MR arthrogram where they actually inject dye into the hip joint. Um, it does tend to show the labral tears a little bit better, but to be honest, nowadays, the quality of the MRIs is so good that I generally do not order a contrast MRI. It just kind of saves the you know, invasiveness of the procedure. Um, the dye itself can cause a lot of irritation to patients if they already have hip pain. I kind of reserve the arthrogram study for revision scenarios. So if you've had a hip scope before and I'm trying to look for reasons why it failed, um, you can see capsular defects here as well. So if a patient's had a history of like a hip dislocation or something like that, the contrast can also help show you if they have like a big capsular defect. Um, but yeah, usually just regular plain MRI is sufficient. So here is an AP pelvis. So, you know, going back to thinking about our imaging, we want to ask ourselves, what's a good AP pelvis? So the criteria is the coccyx should be within about two centimeters of the symphysis. And you want to see symmetric obturator foramen. So you know that the patient's not rotated. And the way they get this image is, you know, the patient's laying supine and then they internally rotate both of the hips about 15 degrees. Um, and then in terms of lines that we look for on the x-ray, does anybody want to shout out kind of the typical lines we look for in the pelvis? You can think back to your trauma yes. days. You have your main um, pelvic ring and then the obturator rings. Um, you have the ileoischial and the iliopectineal lines. Um, and then you have your bilateral teardrops. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll draw a couple things out for you. So um, when I'm looking at for hip um, FAI specifically, I'll look at some of those lines. So I'll look at the anterior wall, which I drew here, the posterior wall here, as well as the sore seal, which is, you know, the French word for eyebrow. So that's the kind of the roof here of the acetabulum. Um, you can see here that this patient has a positive crossover sign because the anterior and posterior walls are kind of crisscrossing. Um, and that's a sign of acetabular retroversion. So normally your acetabulum are face slightly forward. And so this patient's acetabulum are facing either to the side or slightly to the back. You can also look for an ischial spine sign, which um, is present on this X-ray here on the left hip. You see how the ischial spine, you can see kind of within um, this inner um, ring of the pelvis. So this is a positive ischial spine sign. And that again is another sign of acetabular retroversion. So a couple measurements that we classically take um, when we think about the hip. Um, so lateral center edge angle um, normally is between 25 and 40 degrees. So this is how I measure it. I usually draw a line um, across the ischial tuberosities just to neutralize for any kind of rotation or tilt. Um, 90 degrees for that. And then say we're measuring the left hip. So I'll draw a vertical line that's parallel to this line. And then the second line kind of out to the most lateral portion of the sore seal. So normally again, 25 to 40. Dysplastic is considered less than 20. Um, borderline dysplasia is kind of this gray zone between 20 and 25. And then pincer over coverage is greater than 40. So here's an example of a patient that's dysplastic. So if you were to measure their angle, you can see here, you've drawn the first line and you barely, you know, you can just imagine that's definitely gonna be less than 20. Um, a little trick for just grossly thinking about if a patient has dysplasia is if you go to put your pointer right where you wanna do your initial kind of center of the femoral head point, you notice here how my pointer is out, it's not even overlapping the anterior posterior wall of the acetabulum. You know, this patient essentially has a shallow socket. So that's kind of my, um, kind of shorthand way for just eyeballing the x-ray and looking to see if they have dysplasia, if that makes sense. Um, so if they have a uh, lateral center edge less than 25, I'm also going to measure their tonus angle. So tonus angle, also known as the acetabular index, um, again, draw a line normalizing the bottom of the ischial tuberosity, and then a line parallel to that, to the inner portion of the source seal, and then a second line kind of up across to the um, top portion of the source seal. Essentially, it's basically the angle to see how much the acetabulum opens laterally. So normally it kind of gradually slopes down in most hips and in dysplastic hips, it kind of keeps going up and then up, 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 up. 
So normals, you know, around or below 10 and increased is greater than 10 degrees. And this is the same measurement that your guys are looking at in pediatrics when we follow kids with hip dysplasia as well. And then we also grade um, any changes of osteoarthritis in the hip a little bit differently but we, um, than the arthroplasty folks, but we use um, what's called the Taunus classification. And it's pretty straightforward, one through three. Um, zero is no signs of arthritis. One is slightly increased sclerosis. Um, two is joint space loss greater than two millimeters. And then three is severe narrowing or obliteration of the joint space. So I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but I just think of one as sclerosis two is joint space loss greater than two millimeters. Um, and then three is, you know, basically joint space obliteration. So quick quiz, what tonus grade do you think this hip is? Not a trick question. Two? Chuck. Yeah. Two? yeah, perfect. Yeah, so two, so I essentially look for the most severe joint space narrowing and then measure that. So I don't think you need to measure, but I, I will often actually measure for patients just so they can, you know, have a visual. But, um, you know, if you look here, that space is definitely less than two millimeters. Um, and I'll tell you why we care about, you know, grading the Taunus grade um, when we get to some of the outcome studies. Um, and then this is a done lateral. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. It's a little different than a frog lateral. Essentially, you have the patient supine on the x-ray table you flex up the symptomatic hip to 90 and then abduct it about 20 degrees. There's also like a leg holder that the radiologist will use to kind of prop the leg up in this position. So you can do that as well. And then you get this image over here on the right. So the point of this view is to look at the femoral head neck offset. So I tell the patients that, you know, we look for the femoral head, we want it to be nice and round, and then we want it to taper off and become the neck. Um, any flattening or extra bone in this region is essentially cam lesion. Uh, and what do we typically measure on the done lateral? Do you guys know? Can you measure alpha the alpha angle? angle? Perfect. Yeah. So the alpha angle. Um, the done lateral here, you know, versus frog lateral, sometimes the quality of these images are really variable. So it can be easier or harder to measure the alpha angle. This is a really well done image um, taken at the OI. So I think for this one, it's pretty straightforward to measure, but um, the alpha angle is essentially you draw a perfect circle and you want to encompass the entire kind of femoral head. And then you're going to do a line down the neck and then toward the center of the head. And then a second line kind of where the where you lose the sphericity. And then your alpha angle is basically this measurement here. And I'll tell you just by looking at this, the alpha angle is probably about 70 degrees in this patient. So again, I'll remove some of the images so you can just take a look, but you just wanna see where the, where the circle loses its sphericity. And I kind of tell patients, um, you know, the opposite of the alpha angle is actually the beta angle, which is actually this angle down here on the inferior neck. So as a gross kind of measurement, you wanna see the beta angle kind of be symmetric to the alpha angle. And so that's kind of a, a good way to explain it to patients and also kind of a good way to check, you know, after they've had surgery, you really try to cre recreate the beta angle on the alpha side, if that makes sense. And normally the alpha angle is less than 55 degrees and then anything greater than that's consistent with a cam lesion. And then finally, the false profile view, this looks at the anterior coverage of the acetabulum and it's taken like this. So you have the patient standing kind of 60 degrees to the um, x-ray plate and then they're externally rotating their affected foot. Um, so this picture, essentially you're gonna measure the same um, alpha, excuse me, the anterior center edge angle. And that's how you measure it, just the center of the femoral head, line straight up, and then line out to the uh, most anterior portion of the acetabulum. And again, normal um, anterior center edge angle is 25 to 40. So it's the same measurement as um, lateral center edge angle in terms of the normal values. Um, you can also look on this view for more kind of esoteric conditions or rare conditions. So for example, you may have heard of before ischiofemoral impingement where the femur and the ischium are too close together you can often recognize on this view with this space being decreased. This person has a pretty normal space there, um, but that's another uh, reason that I use this view. And then looking at the MRI images for FAI, so here we have the coronal axial sagittal images. 
Um, so here on the coronal, you know, you see the bones here, femoral head, acetabulum. Again, the labrum is this black triangle off to the side. And you see how there's white signal or essentially fluid, joint fluid extending in between the labrum and the acetabulum. And that's consistent with the label tear right here. I always look at it on multiple views to make sure it's like a real finding and to kind of think about it three-dimensionally as well. So on the sagittal, as you follow the hip kind of in, you'll again see a labral tear kind of here's the labrum, and then you see this white signal in the front. And usually these tears are kind of anterior superior, so I'll look for them primarily kind of on the anterior side here on the sagittal. And then finally, the axial, I usually measure, remeasure the alpha angle on um, the axial MRI, but it needs to be an axial oblique sequence, which not everybody has. So you have the neck also in profile. You can see here how this patient has a bunch of cystic changes in the femoral head neck junction too. Again, that's that chronic bony remodeling that we were talking about, Kaz, um, as they kind of repetitively flex the hip up with sports. So kind of like everything, you know, we always talk about non-operative treatment first, then operative. So for non-operative treatment, things like anti-inflammatories, physical therapy is really useful. Um, I have some patients who think, you know, well, I work out, you know, I have pretty good core and gluteal, gluteal strength, but then I make them do a single leg squat in clinic. And I usually try to tell people that if they're single leg squats, they should be better than mine, which mine aren't that great. But a lot of patients have a lot of trouble doing the single leg squat. And I use that as an example to tell them that they need more core and gluteal strengthening. So here are some good examples of some kind of posterior chain strengthening exercises for glute, hips, and core. So your classic kind of bridge exercise, as well as the clamshells. Um, so a lot of people do get better with non-operative treatment. If you have any question of the diagnosis, um, for example, you could think maybe they have a hip flexor tendonitis issue, or maybe they have a little bit of early arthritis, or maybe they have also pain laterally, and maybe it's their trochanteric bursa. Um, you can also consider, you know, a cortisone or lidocaine injection into the hip joint, either done by ultrasound or fluoro guided, just to kind of help you with diagnostic, um, kind of narrowing down the different options there. Um, if it's a young person and I want to do surgery within the next three months, I would do a lidocaine injection because the corticosteroid injection into the joints can be associated with increased risk of infection after arthroscopy. If it's a patient that has kind of early arthritis and like a little bit of a labral tear and I'm trying to avoid surgery in them, I would probably um, err towards a corticosteroid injection in that patient. So how do patients do if they have non-operative treatment? So this was a multi-center randomized control trial done in the UK called the UK Fashion Trial. They looked at 348 patients and they randomized them to hip arthroscopy versus physical therapy. Um, they actually had a pretty low crossover rate, only about 8% of patients crossed over from PT to surgery during the study period. And as you can see here from this graph, um, over the 12 months from randomization, both groups improved over time. So hip arthroscopy is this top line in red here, and then personalized hip therapy or PT is the blue line below. So both patients improved significantly over time, but you can see here at the final um, endpoint at one year, the surgery group did improve more. So I do share this information with patients as well. So if your patient fails non-operative management, you're interested in operating on them, then, you know, the procedure I talked to them about is hip arthroscopy, labral repair, acetabuloplasty, which is reshaping of the socket if their lateral center edge is close to 40 or above 40, femoral osteochondroplasty, and that's the CAM resection, and then finally capsular closure, which I'll talk to you a little bit about the capsular management. Um, this is kind of our typical setup for hip arthroscopy. Um, you can do hip arthroscopy through about two to, thrall, two to three small keyhole incisions. Um, generally use like other arthroscopy cases, one portal for the camera and then one to two portals for the instruments, just depending on your personal technique. Um, historically, people actually had a really tough time getting into the hip joint given the depth of the hip and the congruity. So hip scopes actually didn't become popular probably until the late like 1990s compared to other arthroscopy and other joints. So the solution was actually to distract the hip joint using this traction table. And that's how we use straight instruments in such a curved congruent joint. So here's a setup here. This is the traction table we use. We have the C-arm coming in kind of at an oblique angle, um, the arthroscopy monitor at the top, and then the um, X-ray monitor at the bottom. So the first thing I do is usually draw out my landmarks. So here's a left hip. Here's uh, an outline of the greater trochanter. On 
I know there's a lot of different portals listed here, but the standard ones that I use are the anterior lateral or the AL portal, the modified mid anterior portal, and then the distal anterior lateral accessory portal. Um, some have described the anterior portal. I really don't like to go so close to the femoral nerve. So, you know, you draw your line or you draw your dot at the ASIS. And then I usually draw a vertical line like this down the thigh. And I don't go anywhere medial to that because it can be in danger of going into the femoral neurovascular bundle. Um, so generally I use these three portals. Dr. Zhang will use the modified mid anterior as well as the anterior lateral for his case. Um, there's also some accessory portals. So the proximal anterolateral accessory portal as well as the posterior lateral portal can be useful for other cases. So like removal of loose bodies, um, different types of procedures like that, or if you need to get to the back of the hip joint for some reason. But again, most of the classic FAI cases, the tear is gonna be kind of anterior superior. So you're really doing most of your work kind of in the anterior portion of the acetabulum. So um, Dr. Zhang and I use the same technique in terms of accessing the hip joint. So we start with the air arthrogram, which is a little less traumatic way. You can also just pull gross traction to distract the hip. Um, but essentially, you know, you're gonna have your spinal needle, have it hit the femoral neck. Um, just remember the femoral neck antiversion. So that's gonna change your angle a little bit. Um, you wanna be able to feel bone with your needle and then inject about 20 to 25 cc's of air. Um, I vent the spinal needle by removing the inner trocar. So you can see here, the inner trocar is removed. And then you can have your operating room staff turn about 15 turns of fine traction. And you should see the hip distract in this fashion. You can add kind of five more turns on um, if you need to, but this, this is kind of the classic kind of air arthrogram picture here. Alternatively, don't do the air arthrogram. So what we did in fe my fellowship was actually just pull gross traction and then adduct and extend the hip. Um, until we got much action. Uh, so that's perfect fine as well. Um, I think the air arthrogram is a little bit less traumatic and there has been a study I think showing less post-operative pain with the air arthrogram technique. Um, also, because you wanna be cautious and cognizant of your total traction time should be under two hours for these patients. Um, if you do the gross traction maneuver, that's before you're prepping and draping. So you're probably spending about five or 10 minutes prepping and draping. So I like this method because you're kind of already ready to go. And so you're not contributing to your traction time. All right, and then getting into the hip joint. So once you get your air arthrogram, you wanna see at least about 10 or more millimeters of space here. So you don't ding the cartilage when you're coming in. So you're gonna redirect your spinal needle into the joint. And so you wanna kind of, your goal is to be between the femoral head cartilage and the labrum and acetabulum. Of course, you can't see the labrum on this picture, right? So you're gonna envision it somewhere up here. So I like to actually keep this needle a little closer to the femoral head if I can, just to stay out of the labrum. Um, and then we kind of do a cell dinger technique. Um, so your first portal is through the AL portal. So that's kind of one centimeter anterior um, and just in line with the greater trochanter. And then you're gonna feed a wire through. The wire should hit the back of the acetabulum. If you don't feel an endpoint or it's like migrating into the pelvis then you are not in the hip socket and do not proceed. So you wanna feel that good kind of bony endpoint there. Um, and then, you know, the next thing you're gonna do is establish your second portal, which is gonna be the modified mid anterior portal. Um, and portal placement here is really important. So unlike the shoulder and the knee where you can kind of get away with portal placement not being perfect, that's why in hips, Dr. Zhang and I are kind of really particular and very hands-on initially with you guys making sure the portal's in the right place. Cause if it's not, you literally like can't do some of these cases. So. Here's the second portal being established, the modified mid anterior. And you can notice here with triangulation, the two instruments are really close together. That's because these portals are really only about two centimeters apart. Here is a picture of what it kind of looks like. So sorry, this is actually a left hip um, and then the, the fluoro shots are a right hip, but for the left hip, just to get you oriented, here's a femoral head on the left. Here's the labrum on the right and then acetabulum down below. So you're looking from the AL or anterior lateral portal and this is how you're establishing the modified mid anterior portal. So you see that kind of pink triangle of capsule, that's where you're aiming for. And then you double check it on your CRM to make sure your portals are, you don't wanna see them really far apart because then your instruments are gonna be too far away from each other to work well. Um, I also check on this view to make sure that I'm out of the labrum. So it's possible to enter the hip joint and be like literally inside the labrum or through the labrum, which is not ideal. So you just wanna look above you and make sure that the labrum tissue is totally free. So you can take your scope and look around 
clockwise and you wanna see the whole labrum in its entirety. If you see a white veil of tissue here, it's a good chance you're probably inside the labrum. So you wanna you know, reestablish your portal if that's the case. Here's a quick little video of a diagnostic hip scope. So this is the left hip again, looking at the femoral head to the left, acetabulum to the right. Um, you see the labrum kind of at the top with a little bit of injection. This is looking into the fovea. So that's normally an area that doesn't have cartilage. Um, you'll find the ligamentum teres down below there as well. And then way down in the distance, you can't really see will be the transverse acetabular ligament. And then you see here kind of looking back at the labrum, it's just kind of right in your view. And you can see there, you know, labral fraying and probably a labral tear as well. You can see some fraying here where the labrum meets the cartilage. All right, so um, we classify labral injury based on the Beck classification, which is pretty straightforward. Zero is normal. One is kind of degenerated. Two is a full thickness tear. Three is detached, like it was like almost like a bucket handle tear, like flopped in. And then four is an ossified labrum. We also use the Beck classification of cartilage injury. And that's pretty similar to a lot of other cartilage injury classifications where um, one is kind of softening or contramalacia, two is delamination. And as the labral injury kind of propagates into the cartilage, you can get this wave or carpet sign, which kind of looks like this. Um, and the fluid kind of starts tracking and delaminating the cartilage. So that's why it's kind of important to stabilize the labral tear so you can stop this cartilage um, injury propagation. And then finally, three is kind of cartilage fragmentation, or that's kind of more like end stage kind of cartilage changes. So if we kind of think about the labral repair portion of the procedure, um, typically we're using suture anchors for this. Um, the anchors are pretty small nowadays. They're about 1.4 millimeters or this one that I use. And then at the same time, if indicated and you need to trim their pincer lesion, you can do the acetabuloplasty at the same time. For patients that have a pretty normal lateral center edge angle, so like under you know 27 or so, I don't do a lot of rim trimming here for the acetabulum. I basically just freshen it up so it's a fresh bony bed to repair to. So here's some pictures from the labral repair portion of the case. So this is a right hip. So looking at the acetabulum here on the left, here's the labral. You can clearly see the full thickness, you know, Beck um, type two tear here where the labrum is detached. This is a suture passing device. So the um, anchor's already been placed into the acetabulum and then we're taking one suture and passing it behind the labrum. Usually you can either do this in a simple fashion. So you just pass it behind the labrum and then loop it up and tie it. Or you can do what's called a mattress suture where you penetrate the labrum in two different spots. Um, and this is kind of a completed repair look. So you can see it kind of pulls the labrum back up um, and restores that kind of seal. Oh, I already answered my own question, but okay. So this is a type a uh, grade two or full thickness labral injury, okay? And if you're not sure, you can always probe it as well to check. And then, you know, once you're done in the central compartment, you're gonna take the hip off traction and go into the peripheral compartment. This is actually the hardest part of the case in my opinion, um, just because it can be difficult to visualize and the KM lesion, if you're looking at very small focused area through a small window. And I think it's a really kind of an art to determine how much to remove and to rotate the hip in a good enough fashion so that you can actually understand the cam deformity. So you can see here, this patient has a cam lesion. I'm starting over here and um, just starting to take down some of the bone. Um, you might ask, well, some of this looks like cartilage. Why are you taking that all down? Isn't that articular surface? Um, but remember, we've already taken the traction off and flex the hip up. So all of the articular surface cartilage should be hiding away from you into the, in the hip socket. Um, and then you're also going to use your x-ray to kind of guide your resection here. So I'll take an x-ray shot with my burr right here and then just make sure that um, it's at the level that I want or kind of where the alpha angle um, is starting. So you can use a combination of burr as well as RF probe to um, do your femoral plastic. You can see here to the left of the labral repair and the labrum. So you kind of want to go right up to that area. And then you want to kind of recreate kind of a nice kind of offset there. So these photos are from one of Dr. Zhang's cases, but I thought it was nice um, to show the pre and post-op. So you can see here, this patient has a large cam lesion pre-op and then post-op, it's been kind of nicely tapered down there. Are you checking these intraoperatively with fluoro when you're doing this? Or are you doing this based off what you're seeing arthroscopically? 
Yeah, uh, both. Yeah, so both. Um, I usually start with a hip in neutral rotation and flexed up to about 45 degrees or so. As you internally rotate, you'll see more of the lateral head neck junction come into view. And as you externally rotate, you can work a little bit more medially. And then as you flex the hip up, as you can imagine, you can work a little bit more distally as well. But yeah, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an art because if you don't get the right um, arthroscopic exposure, or if you don't get the right floral images, you can kind of trick yourself and think that you did a, a lot of work when you really didn't. And then one danger with this um, portion of the procedure too, is you just want to keep your burr moving over a broad area. You don't want to like dig a hole. Um, one of the complications that people, one of the feared complications of hip arthroscopy is like a femoral neck fracture, right? Um, which has actually led to the most common reason for revision hip scope, which is under resecting the cam because we're all so nervous about causing a femoral neck fracture. Um, but I think if you get a good exposure and, you know, understand your x-ray and your, you know, you move the hip around so you get a good kind of circumferential view, um, hopefully you can avoid both of those issues. Um, so in terms of rehab, everybody's a little bit different. So um, I use a brace for post-op, Dr. Zang does not, but we both do flat foot weight bearing for about, you know, three weeks or so. Um, in general, I try to limit their range of motion in terms of hip flexion up to 90 degrees um, and avoid any aggressive external rotation or extension. And that's because, again, you're doing the capsule, capsulotomy through the front of the hip, right? So you don't want them to go through your capsular opening. And then physical therapy is about one to two times a week for probably about four to five months for most patients, working on hip range of motion, gait training, gluten core strengthening, and then progressing to endurance, uh, run progression, agility, and then finally sport specific drills. Usually patients will run in about three months if they have a good single leg squat and then contact sports no sooner than about six months. So it's a long rehab. Um, I do tell patients that as well. And then looking at outcomes after FAI surgery. So in high level athletes, they do quite well. Um, this one looked at 33 high school and collegiate athletes. They had great improvement in their modified Harris hip score, their hip outcome score, as well as improvement in their alpha angle. So here are kind of two um, different, you know, x-ray photos showing that. At one year follow-up, nearly 80% returned to play and the vast majority that returned to play returned to the same level of competition. And it took them about nine months to get back to kind of full competition level. So I tell patients, even though you're allowed to return to contact sports at six months, that doesn't mean you're like playing at your full potential in all games, right? That just means you're playing, you're maybe you're back at practice or at scrimmages and things like that. So it does take a few months, I think, to really get tuned up to play um, high level sports. This study shows similar findings. So systematic review, looking at return to sport, 92% um, return to sports and about 88% return to their prior level of competition. So overall really good return to sport um, data. And then you may recognize some of the authors on this study. Um, this study looked at timing of improvement after hip scope for FAI. So they looked at 129 patients undergoing hip arthroscopy for FAI at UCSF, two-year follow-up. Um, mean improvement in the patient reported outcomes ranged from about 18 to 40 points. And then the percent of patients achieving the MCID or the minimally clinically important difference um, was you know quite high. You can see here at two years, you know, greater than 90, you know, 95% for quality in sports, and then about 85% for pain. Um, this paper found that the majority of improvement occurs within about three months of surgery, but certain outcomes like the ones listed here can continue to improve through two years. So it seems like patients that are young athletes do really well after hip arthroscopy and they can continue to improve over two years out from surgery. But what about the rest of the patients that we see? So these are kind of the positive and negative predictors of outcomes for FAI based on this study out of OJSM. So positive predictors are patients who are younger, patients who are male with a normal BMI, tonus grade zero, so no changes on x-ray. And for those that had pain relief, with or those that had injections pre-op, they had good pain relief, which makes sense. The negative predictors are people over 45 who are female, obese, tonus grade at least one or more. So if you have some sclerosis starting on your x-rays, pre-op symptoms that are long lasting over eight months. And then this I think is a really important one, but tonus grade greater than or equal to two. So in other words, they have joint space narrowing um, and less than two millimeters of joint space remaining or if they underwent a labral debridement. So I 
will often quote this data to patients because I see a lot of women in their 40s with you know, some early, you know, chondral changes, maybe tonus grade one, who also have a labral tear. Um, and I tell patients that I really caution them because I think about labral tear in the setting of early arthritis, almost like a degenerative tear. So it's kind of like a degenerative um, meniscus tear. You want to be careful in differentiating like the young athletic patient from the early degenerative patient. Because if you try to go in and scope a hip for a patient with degeneration, they may not really get better. And that's because arthritis may be the true underlying cause of their pain and dysfunction, not the labral tear. So, so uh, go ahead. For, uh, for patients that fall in that bucket of all the positive factors, but then you give them a hip injection, they get no relief. Have you encountered that before? They get no relief? Yeah, like a young male, healthy soccer player, or whatever, then you put a needle in and they're like, that did nothing for me. Yeah. Uh, have you seen that or do you have any thoughts on what you would do with that? Yeah. So, you know, there are other causes of groin pain, a lot of them actually. So I try to rule all those other ones out. So things like inguinal hernias, sports hernias, or that, well, that's actually really a misnomer, but core muscle injury where they've injured either the adductor or the rectus femoris attachment to the pubic symphysis. Hip flexor pain is really, really common and can often be mistaken for FAI symptoms. Um, I did recently scope a hip in a 15 year old running back and I was very cautious because he didn't really have a ton of FAI bony changes yet, but he had a labral tear and I made him go get a diagnostic lidocaine injection. And I told him, if you don't get better after this, I don't think we should scope your hip. It's probably just a lot of hip flexor pain. Um, he did get better. Um, I think, you know, you can think about doing arthroscopy, but I would just lay a lot of crepe and say, you know, a lot of people will get better with the injection. Um, you can also ask, you know, did you even have temporary improvement even for a couple hours? Cause sometimes patients will have that, just that lidocaine effect versus the effect from the steroid. Um, but yeah, I think I would, I would kind of be cautious with those and make sure you rule out all the other anterior hip pain causes. Sounds good. Cool. Um, this patient looked at, or the, sorry, this study looked at how many patients who get hip scopes convert to total hip. So this was a state inpatient database study for California and Florida. And they looked at about 7,000 patients. The mean age in the study was about 44 and about 60% female. So overall about 11.7% converted to total hip within two years, which is kind of a big fail, right? I mean, you don't wanna do a hip scope do all that work, have a patient do about a year of rehab and then have them get a total hip within two years, unless you're a joint replacement surgeon. Um, so they, this study stratified based on age. So age under 40, about 3% converted. And then if you jump to the age bracket between 60 and 69 that are getting hip scopes, 35% um, converted to total hip within two years. So this study, you know, cautioned, um, you know, increased risk of converting to a total hip as you increase in age, increase in osteoarthritis changes, increased risk for those that are obese, as well as those that have a low volume hip arthroscopy center, which is kind of interesting. And I think that might have to do a little bit with patients that have things like labral debridements done instead of labral repairs, or if, you know, you're, you don't have a lot of experience doing hip arthroscopy, you know, you can cause things like iatrogenic chondral injuries and things like that. Um, I think a lot of, you know, here are some other studies which have essentially shown similar findings. So this paper showed basically increasing rates of conversion to total hip as you increase in age. So it's a little depressing to tell my patients, you know, that are 45 and older that they're old for hip scope, but I just tell them, I just, you know, tell them that I'm being honest and, you know, this is what the data shows. Um, this is another study showing, you know, and you see here the age groups at the bottom stratified, outcome scores decreasing as you increase in age. Um, and then this graph shows in the solid bars are women and in the um, dashed bars are men. So overall, you know, interestingly, everybody did improve compared to their baseline, okay? But patients that are over age 45 perform worse in terms of their outcomes than younger patients and females over age 45 will probably did the worst. So this study found age and gender were significant predictors with older age being the most influential. And then overall, if you're younger than age 45, it seems that females perform about the same as males after um, hip arthroscopy surgery for FAI. So I'd be cautious with re recommending hip arthroscopy um, as people age increase. They do still improve compared to their baseline, but maybe not as much as their younger counterparts and they have higher conversion rates to total hip. So another outstanding study done by one of, or some of our residents, I should say, 
This is a Kaiser database study um, looking at Kaiser in North America and again looked at who converted to total HIP within two years. Um, the mean age in this study is a little bit lower, 37, 57% female, about um, five years follow up. Uh, about 5% converted to total HIP and they converted early, about nine months. So it's like those, a lot of patients haven't even finish their full, you know, progression back to sports until six months. So that's kind of depressing. And again, found similar findings, increasing age associated with early total hip conversion. Um, did not find any association with BMI, race, sex, or prior hip scope. And then, you know, here are the conversion rates and you can see how they increase as the age of the patient increases. One thing I thought that was kind of interesting from the study, um, this was the breakdown in terms of races for the patients who underwent hip scopes and the Kaiser uh, Northern California population. So you can see that really overall about 76% of patients who underwent hip arthroscopy were white, followed by about 10% which were unknown or not reported, and then about 6% Asian, 6% African American, and then really few in terms of Native American, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. If you compare this to, so I pulled data from the Kaiser North America member survey in 2017. So this is a study looking at patients ages 25 to 90 and ask them to self-report their race and ethnicity. So you can see here the breakdown of the Northern California kind of patients that are seen in the Kaiser system versus the patients who are getting hip scopes. They're really not equal at all, right? So you can see here the population of white patients about 30%, Asian 26, African American some 17, Latinx, 17, or 18%. So these two groups of patients don't really make sense to me. Um, so this is kind of our population, and then this is who's getting a hip scope. So maybe you could think about a couple different reasons why this could be the case. So yes, both of these databases look at patients with slightly different parameters and may include different age groups. But I think we can say there's a large enough difference in the percentage of patients that are actually getting hip scopes to wonder if there's a, why there's a difference there. So is the natural history of FAI really that different? Are mostly just white patients getting FAI? Or, you know, to be honest, probably more of an issue with equity, right? Or access to care, or patients getting consultation for a hip arthroscopy. So I'm gonna insert here a shameless plug for future research projects if anybody is interested. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the racial and ethnic background of those undergoing hip scopes versus the population. If you just look at this Kaiser subset, I think is um, quite disparate. And we could bring this up at least so that people can recognize this um, as an issue. Um, switching gears a little bit, I mentioned to you guys before kind of hip capsular management. So in the last couple of minutes here, I just wanted to talk about um, how to get into the hip joint um, and how to get out safely. So one part of the hip arthroscopy surgery is you have to cut the capsule to get into the joint, which is not that different from other hip, uh, other arthroscopies, right? The difference for the hip capsule is that the hip really, can, the capsule contributes to the stability of the joint. And it's made of, of these three um, ligaments, the iliofemoral, the pubofemoral, and the ischiofemoral. Um, and accessing the joint, you have to cut them. The larger the cut in the capsule that you make, the wider the field of view and the easier it is to do the surgeries but the integrity of the hip capsule is really important to hip function and stability. So more recently, there's been kind of a shift towards recommending closing the capsule. In the past, people used to cut the capsule out or not close it at all. And we're thinking now that the, the capsule is actually quite important. So here's a picture of a couple different types of capsulotomies. So Zing uses the periportal capsulotomy here which is essentially you make the anterior lateral portal over here, you make the modified mid anterior portal over here, and then you just work between the two. So this is kind of classic for the same as if you would do in the shoulder, the knee, things like that, right? Um, another option for types of capsulotomy are the inner portal. So you're connecting here the two portals and making kind of a transverse cut along the ischiofemoral ligament, iliofemoral ligament, excuse me. Um, which is a technique that I use. Um, you can also extend down the inner portal and oops, if you make a vertical limb here, that's called a T capsulotomy. That probably provides the best exposure for looking at cam lesions, but of course, then you're left with kind of a big gaping hole in your capsule compared to the small holes in the periportal. So here's a nice um, anatomic diagram looking at the inner portal capsulotomy. Um, and so, here you're looking through the modified mid-anterior portal 
and you're looking kind of backwards back at the anterior lateral portal. And this is a arthroscopic scalpel blade that's being inserted through the capsule. And again, the capsule is this pink tissue with the labrum over to your right and the femoral head over to your left. And then this knife is actually just gonna cut towards the camera. So I'm gonna bring it back towards my face like this. And that's how you create the inner portal capsulotomy. And then if you so choose to do a T-capsulotomy, um, later on in the case is when I would do it at the time when you're going into the peripheral compartment and then you're going to extend that cut down the femoral neck and then kind of flap the two leaves of the T open and that gives you a really broad view of the entire femoral head neck junction. So that there's growing evidence in the literature that closing the capsule can actually result in better patient reported outcomes and decreased risk of revision surgery. So if you cut the capsule open or remove parts of the capsule and do like a capsulectomy. You can be left with capsular defects. Patients can have both macro and micro instability. And I've actually seen this happen before where patients can actually have frank hip dislocations after hip scopes because they have large capsular defects. So in fellowship, I saw a patient who was about eight months post-op from a hip scope, externally rotated her hip in the shower and just frankly dislocated out the front of her capsule. Um, she ended up needing a labral and capsule reconstruction with LRAFT. So, you know, you just want to think about how, you know, you're taking care of the tissues and how you're kind of restoring the native anatomy. Um, I know we're all really focused on kind of the labral repair and the shaving down the cam lesion and everything, but don't forget about the capsule on your way out. So this study looked at uh, about 64 patients and compared whether they were did a partial repair versus a complete repair of the capsule. So with the partial repair, they closed up the T part of the capsulotomy, but left the inner portal open and the complete repair, they closed everything. The complete repair group in this study had better hip outcome scores and satisfaction scores. And, you know, they weren't really powered to look at um, revisions, but they reported four revisions in the partial repair group, but uh, no revisions needed in the closed repair, a complete repair group, excuse me. There's probably more evidence for capsule repair um, presented in these two studies. So this study um, split kind of half their patients got closure, half the patients didn't get any repair. At two years, the closure group had better hit outcome scores and VAS scores. Um, a study by Philippon again did half the group repaired, half the group unrepaired, and at five years, the closure group had better outcome scores as well. So over here to the diagram on the right, this is um, showing the T limb being closed up. So you can see here how you can see the femoral head neck and then the T limbs being closed up with sutures. I would say that, um, you know, a reason why that people don't do the capsule repair is honestly, it's pretty difficult. It's almost like doing a rotator cuff repair surgery after, at the very end of doing the labral repair and acetabulo and femoroplasty. So by the time you're getting to the capsule repair portion of the case, you've probably been in the hip for quite some time. And, you know, I think it's, it is time consuming and it's also not um, a listed CPT code. So that may have some influence on why people choose to not repair the hip capsule at the end. But I think some of these papers do argue, you know, some reasonable evidence to consider repairing it. Um, there is some groups that say capsulotomies don't need to be repaired, so you can leave it unrepaired. So Dome et al. said there's no difference in five-year outcomes with or without repair. However, I would kind of caution that this paper, they didn't randomize, so it's just kind of surgeon dependent for decision-making. And um, in this paper, they scoped hips for lots of different reasons. So I would say the reasons to leave the capsule open would be in cases of like arthritis, which hopefully you're not scoping arthritis anyways, but septic hip, you can leave the capsule open or, you know, synovitis, so inflammatory conditions, you may consider leaving the hip capsule open as well. Um, the study out of HSS showed capsular healing universally at six months, whether or not they had um, the capsule formally sewn closed. They did an inner portal for this study. Um, and, you know, some of the limitations for this is, you know, small group, it may be underpowered, and they didn't look at any clinical outcomes. So, you know, to close or not to close, I think, you know, based on the literature and in my opinion, you probably don't need to close periportal capsulotomies. We don't really close capsulotomies elsewhere in the body in the, sh in the shoulder or the knee either. Um, but as the size of the capsulotomy increases, I would consider closing. So for inner portals, I do close those. And I think you should definitely close T capsulotomies um, with the goal of kind of restoring normal hip anatomy for the patient. So in summary, I say not all labral tears are created equal. So try to differentiate between labral tears due to FAI and then labral tears due to early hip arthritis and degeneration. 
And you can do this based on the age of the patient, their x-ray and MRI appearance. Um, outcomes for hyperarthroscopy for FAR are excellent if you correctly indicate your patients. I think the hip capsule is really important and the management really depends on the type of capsulotomy you're performing. And then um, finally, you know, comprehensive PT and rehab is always important, whether you're treating people non-op or operatively. So you really need the buy-in from the patient. And I tell people just because I prescribe it one to two times a week, you should really be going or doing your exercises more like five to seven times a week. So don't come back and tell me, oh, I went to PT two times and I'm not better. Um, so I think that's a a plug for our great therapists. Um, here are my references, and then I'm happy to take any questions from the group. All right, well, thanks everybody. Kaz, did you? I was just gonna say thanks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I actually oh. do have a question, Steph. Um, sure. At the VA, uh, Dr. Sampson does these in the lateral position, and right. um, he's pretty outspoken about what he thinks the benefits of uh, scoping lateral are. You can see better, like posteriorly, um, and a variety of other things. Um, what do you think about the lateral position? Is there any role for that um, if you're otherwise really only used to scoping supine? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of position to scope, I think I'll, kind of like the shoulder, it's very dependent on where you trained and who trained you. You're more likely to do what you learned in training than to try to pick up a new technique outside of your training. Um, I think there's probably benefits of both. Um, you know, I think in Dr. Sampson's hands, he's great at doing lateral position. I honestly think the extra articular or peripheral compartment is can be very confusing and very disorienting. It's kind of like the subacromial space without landmarks. So personally, I in my hands, I think it's a bit easier and given my training to start in the hip joint and move outwards and then use my capsulotomy to kind of orient myself where I am in the peripheral compartment. I think he does a great job of knowing exactly where he is in the peripheral compartment and then getting into the hip joint from there. But that's personally one of the, as I you know, start my hip practice, I think that's a portion that I find really hard is being in the periphery and just getting kind of oriented because everything kind of looks the same. <laughs>